To many people, Israel is a place of Bible stories and ancient ruins. In hundreds of archaeological digs like this one, Israelis are carefully preserving their past, but they're also keeping an eye on the future. And not just their future, the future of the world. One of the Jewish commandments is tikkun olam, to, which means, translation to English, is to, to repair the world under God, to make the world a better place. I see a direct correlation between our belief in tikkun olam and this incredible explosion of activity and innovation in Startup Nation. Today, the world is focused on saving the environment, but Israelis were green long before it was popular, about a century before. It's part of the Zionism dream to create a green land, a green country, and actually with time, with experience and research, we have studied how to do it. The prophet Isaiah wrote about a time when the desert would rejoice and blossom as a rose. To Israelis, that's more than an ancient prophecy. It's a commandment. Israel is a tiny state. Look at a map of our region. We use always to joke, you know, there's not even enough place on, on the map to write the name of Israel. So we had to conserve it, to keep it, to maintain it. Uh, this is what we have. To the early settlers in Israel, going green meant planting trees. And they started in the Negev Desert, a place that gets only one to seven inches of rain a year. In the 1940s, Jerusalem was still under Arab control. And Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, believed that the Negev was the future of Israel. So he ordered the creation of a man-made forest there. But his team of scientists said it couldn't be done. Ben-Gurion's response? No problem. We'll get new scientists. The prime minister got his new scientists, and the Negev desert began to blossom. Today, the Yatir forest has more than four million trees including carob, pine, olive, and fig. Israel is amongst the fewest countries in the world that at the end of the 20th century, there are much more trees than were at the beginning of this century. Till now, we have planted over 240 million trees, which is a nice number to this small country. In the center of the forest is a vineyard planted on the ruins of another one that existed here 2,000 years ago. Scientists researched the best plants to grow in the Negev, and one of their sources was the Bible. There are plenty of archaeological ruins everywhere. Water cisterns, uh, dams, uh, terraces, everywhere. And we have started with reconstruction of some of these ancient farms. We have planted biblical trees, and the trees are surviving without additional irrigation by collecting runoff water, the same systems that our forefathers did 2,000 years ago. The trees not only produce fruit, they also clean the environment by absorbing carbon dioxide. Studies show that planting similar forest on just 12% of the world's arid land would reduce carbon in the atmosphere by a gigaton a year. That's equal to the carbon output of a thousand coal plants. Today, scientists from around the world come to Israel to study the Yatir forest. We like to serve. We are proud to serve all our achievements to other countries. And of course, we want to share our knowledge and study from other countries' experience. Israelis are not only working to protect the environment, they're also looking for new ways to keep the country running without oil. Israel itself, it's a beautiful country, a country definitely worth visiting with tremendous, lush, interesting areas, but we don't have the traditional gold mines and massive oil and diamonds. We basically have a country of human resources rather than natural resources. So we very much value what little we have. 
Israel may be short on oil, but it does have one natural resource that's virtually unlimited. Israel's greatest natural resource, sun. We do have a lot of sun here. It's a hot place, so we produce solar energy. For much of the year, the sun beats down on a land that's mostly desert. But what some might see as a liability, Israel has turned into an advantage. Israelis have been using rooftop solar panels since the 1950s, when they were still unheard of in the rest of the world. 90% of Israeli homes have a solar water heater. There's nowhere else in the world that has that kind of thing. In 2011, Israel's first commercial solar field was completed in the southern Arava Valley. The company, Arava Power, now has nine other fields under construction and plans for 40 more energy projects in Israel over the next three years. Their goal is to supply one-tenth of Israel's power. The company's founders are now building solar fields in several third world countries like Haiti, Ecuador, and Rwanda. The solar field in Rwanda should be up and running by the end of 2013 and will provide 8% of Rwanda's energy. Israel has been a leader in clean technology from the beginning. Part of it also is that our neighbors have had a lot of oil and have sort of corrupted the world economic system and the world political system and used it unfairly to impose, I think, sometimes harmful ideologies. And therefore, if Israel can fight the world dependence on oil, what would be a better thing than that? In 2005, an Israeli software developer named Shai Agassi heard a similar question at a conference. We were asked, how are you going to make the world a better place? Agassi's answer, take a single country off oil. Then the rest of the world will follow. The first step was to assemble a fleet of cars that could run without oil. So Agassi started a company called Better Place, which offered an electric battery-powered car. The car battery recharges overnight in special power outlets installed in the owner's home. And for longer trips, drivers can switch out the car's battery at stations all over Israel. The entire process takes less than five minutes. I hear these go fast. They're quite fast, so you have no gearbox. Why, why feel, is it so fast? What you'll feel on the acceleration is, uh, is full maximum torque. There's no gears, there's just literally drive, neutral, and reverse. Zero to 60 in how many seconds? About 6.9, I believe. Really? Maybe I can wipe out my cameraman as I go by. As a consumer, one of the things that is really appealing to me is the absolute quiet. The goal with this car was to make a car and a network that can support it, that appeals to everyone. You don't have to be a greenie to say, I want this car. You can say, I like it because it's fast and it has great power and acceleration. Um, and I can fit my entire family in it. That was fun. Unfortunately, public demand for electric cars hasn't caught up with the vision of Better Place. And the company filed for bankruptcy in May of 2013. But some experts say timing is everything, and the battery-powered car will ride again. In the meantime, Israelis have another option that's just as green, and thousands of dollars cheaper. In 2008, an avid biker named Azar Gaffney had an idea. Suddenly, it just struck my mind. Why not to make a bicycle out of cardboard? Soon after, I talked to three engineers, which I really highly appreciate, and they said, it's impossible. There's no way it can be done. While I was eating with my wife one day, she noticed that I'm a little bit disturbed. I told her all the things about the engineers I went to and all the things that they said about it's impossible. And then she looked at me. <laughs> and then she said, I know you. If you're not gonna try it, then you're gonna drive yourself crazy, then you're gonna drive me crazy, then you're gonna drive the entire family crazy. So just go ahead and try it. Four years and six prototypes later, the cardboard bicycle was ready to ride. The finished bike weighs in at just 20 pounds, 
and yet it can hold a 500 pound rider. And unlike regular cardboard, it's completely waterproof. Mass production on the bike will start in late 2013. It'll cost about $9 to make and sell for around 60. Where do you get this from? What right do you have to dream that way? We're people of dreams. It's all through the Bible. That's always been our methodology, if you will, in the Jewish people. God gives us dreams. It's for man to interpret them and man to experience them. And that's really the roots, I think, of, of much of our innovation. The fact that we're so flourishing here is a sign that this was God's will, that this is what was supposed to happen. This is the plan. We're good people. We're family-oriented people. We have an incredible army and society. I think that we have just begun to figure out that we have to tell our story about who we are rather than engage in constant bickering over the Middle East conflict. We have to go convey what the beauty of Israel is.